So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salawat wa salaman ala Sayyidina wa Habibullah, sallallahu, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, I want to start off today by thanking um, our care team members, Fred and all those on the team, as well as the viewing public. My name is Afaf Nasher. I'm the executive director for the New York chapter for CARE. And we're your local civil rights Islamic organization. We deal with all discriminatory matters and advocacy issues that, that help our Muslim brothers and sisters as a nonprofit services are for free. And with the pandemic, we of course have had to move remotely for social distancing purposes. And what we've done is we've tried to coordinate with folks in our community who are also providing services to the community. And we wanna highlight that work and the importance of that work and the kind of issues that have come up since the pandemic has become so widespread. And today our focus is um, the services of chaplains. And in particular, we're gonna be looking at two aspects of chaplain life, one within the prison system and one in the hospitals. And we have two esteemed panelists, Imam Talib and Sister, um, Sister Zilfa. And I think I'm gonna start rather than telling the audience about you, give you an opportunity, please introduce yourselves, tell them a little bit about who you are and the work that you do. Imam Talib, can we start with you inshallah? Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. So this is your brother, Imam al Hajj Talib Abdul Rashid. I am the Imam of the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood Incorporated. I have uh, been the imam for the past 30 years at the mosque, which is uh, located in Harlem, New York City. As of uh, February 2018, I retired after 40 years of service as a Muslim chaplain in the jails and prisons of uh, New York City and New York State. I'm also a former president of the Madri Shashura, that is the Islamic Leadership Council of New York. Currently, I serve as the special representative of the Madri for restorative justice, human and civil rights. And in that uh, capacity, I serve as the uh, chairman of a statewide uh, aggregation of Muslim chaplains who work in the uh, jails and in the prisons. And I serve as an advisor now that I'm retired. I serve as an advisor to the New York City Department of Correction and also the New York State Department of uh, Correctional and Community Services. And of course, that particular area is that of Islamic Affairs. Alhamdulillah for that service. Jazakallah khair Imam Talib. And my sister Zilfa, could you please introduce yourselves as yourself and the kind of work that you do, please? Yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. All praise belongs to Allah, Lord of the world, most gracious, most merciful. I ask Allah to help us all in this hard time of the COVID-19 coronavirus. May he help and cover all with his protection and his mercy. So my name is Chaplain Zilfa, and I am a volunteer chaplain at Queens Hospital, New York, and Jamaica Hospital, Parker Jewish Hospital. I am the CEO and founder of Visiting Care Service and Rafa's House of Worship and Learning Center. I currently helping at the hospital, and also I'm doing my private service. Uh, home visiting, which is being affected now to do home service. So most of my service now is done. I used to do visiting service, like visiting home, but at present, it's all indoor, online services. I do have some uh, of my chaplains, a crisis chaplain in the field, but for myself, I stay indoor and I'm doing service from home. 
inshallah. Okay, so let's dive right into the really the main issues that we have in front of us. And I think it was really, really important in previous conversations that I've had with people who provide this kind of service to understand the dynamics of what it looks like from day to day. As I spoke to you, Imam Talib, I told you that I have never been in a jail or prison myself. I don't understand, you know, just even the physical confines and what it means and and the kind of situation that our brothers and sisters are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. And Sister Zilpha, that'll apply to you as far as, you know, just the hospital setting when people are perhaps terminally ill, for example. And so if we can please go through, you know, we know about your titles, but Imam Talib, why don't we start with you and you can sort of tell us what does it mean to be a chaplain? What exactly do you do with, within the service when you are walking into a jail or a prison, please? And what that means to your constituents? Well, first of all, again, I'm, I'm going to speak to you from the perspective of what chaplains do. I'm retired as a chaplain personally. I'm supervising and advising chaplains now. The uh, chaplains, the Muslim chaplains, uh, which who for the most part are imams, uh, and there are also a couple of sisters who work as uh, chaplains in the jails and uh, in the prisons. They are a uh, unique body of people they are the equivalents. They have uh, Christian colleagues, Jewish colleagues, and uh, colleagues of other faiths that work in this unique setting that's the uh, setting of incarceration. As you pointed out, Sister Fav, most people have never been inside a jail, never been inside of a, a, a prison, perhaps, and therefore, really, you have no idea of what it's like or what's going on in there. Um, I mentioned that I retired after 40 years of service, and one of the profound conclusions that I came to early in that work is that uh, it's not like what you see in the movies it's not like what you see on television. The prison system is a multi-million dollar system. There are more people incarcerated in America than uh, in the entire world. Prison is, and, and understand when I draw the distinction between jails and prison, a jail is a lockup facility for short-term incarceration. For instance, the system that we have here in New York City, Rikers Island and so forth, and uh, those are holding facilities for people who are yet to go on trial, people who are yet to be sentenced, etc. That is in contradistinction to people who are incarcerated in prisons. Prisons are facilities, lockup facilities for long-term incarceration once a person has been sentenced. So chaplains, not just the Muslim chaplain, but chaplains of various faiths serve a vital role in the jail and prison system uh, the system is an unnatural one. It's unnatural to take people and lock them up on a 23 to 24 hour uh, uh, basis, but that is the nature of what it means to be in prison. So the chaplains serve the purpose of uh, serving as a, uh, a caretaker, if you will, a shepherd for those who are in incarcerated. Chaplains within the jail and prison system, they teach uh, uh, religion, they counsel uh, the men and women who are incarcerated there, they uh, conduct 
services, religious services within the prison setting or the jail setting. They serve as the uh, uh, staff people who ensure that the uh, religious rights of every incarcerated man or woman is uh, respected and fulfilled. And finally, they perform a wide variety of pastoral responsibilities. Uh, our sister, she uh, does work in the hospital where there are hospitals in prison as well. And so the uh, imam or the sister who is a prison chaplain, he or she also visits uh, the sick, uh, does notifications uh, in case of family deaths and that sort of thing. So it's a very important and a very vital service. Jazakallah khair, ma'am. I really appreciate that. And let me give Sister Zilpa an opportunity to sort of describe to us what your services are sort of on a daily basis what when you walk into the hospital setting or when you do what you do as a volunteer, what does it look like? How much time are you spending? You know, who are your constituents? We can't hear okay. you. Oh, there we go. Go ahead. Oh. You're good. You're good. Go ahead. I you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So my, res my responsibility as a chaplain in a hospital, I serve as an interfaith chaplain at Queen's Hospital. When I go there, I usually make the rounds with the doctors. You know, in the morning they make the rounds. You go around and you find out what's the need of chaplain. After the rounds with the doctors, I personally go to their chaplain who have needs and I try to meet their needs. It is a very, very much uh, demand for Muslim chaplains in the hospital. They're, they're Many, many people there, there has no one, their senior that has nobody visited them. You know, it is at that time, a chaplain comes in very, very useful. There was one incident, I went to an uh, older person. As I walked in the room, and um, she was just staring at the door, hoping her son was coming to visit her. And so as I came in the room, she says, oh, I am waiting for my son but I'm not seeing my son coming. I said, okay, I'm here. You sure really, you will be here with me. You will spend some time with me. I said, absolutely. It, it's so important being by the bedside of patients in the hospital, sitting there with them. They get depressed, they get lonely. Sometimes they just even need something from the nurse and usually the nurses, they're busy. I kind of help them go and get something that, they need it uh, it's so important that they, they would ask you can you please pray for me or can you call my family can you let them know what i'm going through simple thing goes a far way as a hospital chaplain we try to meet their needs like halal food to make sure that they get a halal food and you know these are some of the services that a muslim chaplain does in the hospital setting um, there were one incident where a patient died at the hospital and he had no family member and they put him in the mark. And however, I find out that this patient passed away. I went and I find out where is him. I finally find out where he is and I get service for him. I sort of arranged for the Muslim uh, um, service to come and get him. They took him to the masjid. They did a gusul janaza for him. And so, alhamdulillah, he was able to get a good burial, a good janaza. So this is so important to have a Muslim chaplain there. Had I not been there, what would have happened to this poor brother that had no one? Only God knows. But these are some of the services that a Muslim chaplain, you know, perform at the hospital setting. I mean, really, I'm so touched by both of you and what you're explaining to us because it seems like it's such a huge and vital role. Um, and it seems it that the, the types of things that I'm hearing from you, Imam Thalaba and Sister Zilfa, is that you're advocates for your constituents, you provide companionship and mentorship, and, and you're there for them at very, very vulnerable times. 
And it would seem that access is key to that. And what worries me is that today with the pandemic, I know there have been huge restrictions with regards to access. And Imam Talib, if you can, I know that you're retired, but I also know that you're very much um, in tune with other uh, other folks who are serving as chaplains, can you please describe to us who are listening and viewing and learning from you, does the access for chaplains today with the pandemic, does it, has it ceased? Is it, are, are your constituents, are people in prison still able to see their imams? And, um, and what kind of concerns or what kind of special issues is this pandemic posing for chaplains as they try to get into the prisons to, to provide that allyship, to provide that advocacy, and to provide spiritual guidance to those that need it? Well, first of all, you have to realize that most Muslim chaplains statewide, there are more Muslim chaplains in New York State than in any other state in the country. And, these, and for the most part, we're not talking about volunteers here. We're talking about salary, uh, New York City and New York State um, employees, Muslim chaplains, that's who we're talking about. And also there's a small percentage of uh, volunteer chaplains. When I first started out in the work uh, 42 years ago, I, I started off as a, a volunteer chaplain because at that time, um, there were no Muslim chaplains at all in the jail system of New York City and very few Muslim chaplains in the state prison. Nowadays, in the year 2020, people will take for granted the fact that uh, incarcerated Muslims, and by the way, most Muslims who are incarcerated uh, uh, in the prison system, New York State prison system, most of them have become uh, Muslims during their incarceration. Most of them don't enter prison as Muslims. They uh, become Muslim during their period of uh, long-term incarceration. So it's very important to view the Muslim chaplaincy within the jails and the prisons uh, prisons in the same way that you're looking at the society as a whole. It's not separate. Every single uh, city and state uh, facility is on a reduced workforce right now, or what they call, quote unquote, uh, they're dividing the workforce into a uh, quote unquote essential and non essential. Uh, personnel. So again, in looking at Muslim chaplains, I, you know, I want to emphasize this. The Muslim chaplain is a professional uh, brother or sister. And for instance, uh, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, last Friday, I believe it was, I received a telephone uh, call from the uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, over ministerial services for the entire state of New York. And uh, that Deputy Commissioner contacted uh, me in my capacity as a special representative of the Muslims because they were trying to figure out what to do about Juma. 13% of the uh, New York State prison population are Muslims. And so you, you're talking about thousands and thousands of Muslims who under ordinary circumstances attend Salatul Juma, et cetera. So the prison authorities, they were trying to figure out what do we do about this? Can, can social distancing be practiced within the context of a Friday Juma service? And really the answer is no. So I had to explain to them, one, what's going on out here in the society, how the greater majority of the mosques, of the masjids are closed, and why they are closed, not just in America, but across the world. And then uh, make a recommendation to them 
that the men and women who are Muslim, that they be uh, permitted to stay in their cells and uh, pray Salatul Juma in their cells, not Salatul Juma, but Salatul Zuhr in place of Salatul Juma. Then further, uh, chaplains within a jail and prison setting, the chaplains are for the most part considered uh, what's now being classified as non-essential personnel. So I had to further make a recommendation that in implementing these special procedures for Juma, and again, I'm, I'm sorry to take so long to explain this, but I, again, I know people don't know the reality. They don't know that in the jails and the prisons that you, you couldn't always have Juma. You didn't always have halal food. These were things that came about after decades, literally, of struggle. The uh, Attica prison rebellion that took place in 1971, bloodiest prison rebellion in American history. But one of the results of that prison rebellion, uh, Attica, which took place in, in New York, was the implementation of multi-faith chaplains. It was one of the demands of the prisoners, uh, several of whom lost their lives. So the existence of chaplains within the jail and prison system is a very serious thing. And religion is very serious programming. So I had to recommend to the authorities that in order to uh, navigate the uh, challenges of Juma in prison, that the imams and the sisters who are Muslim chaplains uh, be shifted from uh, non-essential personnel to essential personnel, just so that they could go into the prisons uh, and the jails, counsel the brothers and sisters, explain to them that there were going to be some, some uh, changes. And when I suggested this, um, the prison authorities, they were completely open. They appreciated the recommendations. They implemented exactly uh, what we uh, recommended. And they said to me, because I asked them, what are you doing about other congregate services? What are you going to do about the Jewish services? What are you going to do about the uh, Christian services and what have you? And they stated that they had already decided that whenever and wherever the services of a chaplain uh, is needed, that they would be uh, temporarily activated to, uh, to be able to come in and have access uh, to the population there. So uh, okay. chaplains are very important in the prison system, and the system recognizes the importance of chaplains. Alhamdulillah. Well, I'm glad that there has been some movement with regards to regaining access as essential employees. Is that actually the case with you, Sister Zilfa? Are you still maintaining access in hospitals and other volunteers and other chaplains at hospitals? Are you still able to walk in and to help people? No, at this point of time, no, I am not able to walk in and offer my help which is at this point of time, it is so essential that people really need a chaplain more than before. Patients are scared, they're lonely, they're all these things. However, uh, my supervisor who is allowed to go, because I am not a paid chaplain, I'm a volunteer. So I contact my supervisor and they are making preparation. If for example, there is a Muslim patient and they need a chaplain, they are making preparation for myself or someone else to bring them in. Also, I have understand that if someone die of the uh, coronavirus, they're not releasing the body, So, but they will be allowing a chaplain to go to the hospital. So at this point of time, I am making uh, a preparation for all of that. I am staying in contact with my supervisor there, um, phone calls and this is what I have been doing at present. Um, I am not allowed to go in at this point of time. How does that make you feel, Sister Zofa? Because what I'm trying to see from you, just from your face, your language, and your voice, 
it seems as if not only you're completely committed to it, but it seems like this is a passion of yours because you just see this overwhelming need and you understand that the illnesses have only grown and that patients in hospital care is only in more further demand. So given the opportunity, if they had given you the choice, would you still be walking in there even though you understand that that poses risks to yourself and your own family? Um, yes, I would. I would have to take all precaution. And, and yes, I would. If someone really needs me, yes, I will. I would take precaution. At this present, it's, it's very, very, um, what's very, very sad that I cannot be there to help our Muslim um, patients. It, it's, it's a very hard situation. Yeah. And with regards to, you know, advocating for Muslims, I know that, you know, sometimes people don't necessarily identify themselves as Muslims in, in a hospital or something, right? So doctors may not even know that the patient is Muslim, right? And God forbid somebody were to pass away or has some special needs, how would they even know to call you? Is that not a problem that you have faced? No, actually what happened, because uh, I kind of monitor the volunteer group there, uh, the hospitals know every month I give them a list of chaplains from different faiths. And so the hospitals know if anything regarding the Muslim, they knew that they will be contacting me. And they did in the past. And, and I, you know, call them and let them know I am still here. I'm still willing to help our Muslim chaplain. They know that because I have that relationship with the, with the uh, services at the hospital. And my supervisor, I'm keeping in touch with her so she knows when the maids be there can contact me directly. Okay, Imam Talib, with regards to you know, providing essential services, you know, we spoke a little bit about the job duties and the responsibilities, everything from religious teaching to, you know, congregational prayers, which are obviously suspended because of the pandemic, even in the prison system. Um, but you also touched upon being an advocate for people, something that I was just talking to Sister Zilpa with as well. And, you know, I'm concerned that with limited access, potentially, um, that that kind of advocacy won't be quite as strong. Is that something that you're concerned with, with regards to, let's say, for example, we know at CARE New York, for example, we do get cases in which people have issues with obtaining halal food, with being able to maintain, let's say, their hijab or a beard, you know, whether they're incarcerated or in the hospital, for example. Do you feel like that, Imam Talib, you're still able, the, cha the chaplains still have the ability to advocate for the chaplains as strongly as perhaps they did before? Yeah, the, uh, again, I'm sorry. I have to really try to contextualize this. I know that CARE New York is an advocacy organization. I know you're a lawyer. Uh, this is a totally different situation we're dealing with now. The entire society is in a state of crisis. And the entire society is trying to figure out how to deal with the challenge posed by this underprepared society in which we live. And if you think about the concerns that exist out here where we are, where all of us are, those concerns are magnified exponentially within the uh, jail and prison system. The, 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 just as there are rights of people that exist in society, there are rights that exist inside of the jails. And it's very early now. I mean, we're still in the process of going uh, through uh, a societal uh, lockdown. And, it's, and this is of a public health nature. I can't emphasize this enough. The, the, uh, by nature, both jails and prisons are closed societies. Right. They're, they're, what's, they're what are called closed population. Right. That means that if an outbreak occurs within a jail, or if an outbreak occurs within a, a prison, it is going to have tremendously grave consequences. So right now, everyone 
is on their pay, P's and Q's, so to speak. Everyone is being extremely cautious, perhaps even overly cautious. And that includes those who are incarcerated. That includes those who work inside the jails and prisons. And that includes those who are administrators. So the major concern now is not so much whether it's, you know, a, a, a person is going to be able to have access to a halal meal. They get halal meals. The New York City jail system is the only jail system in America that has halal 24 hours a day, seven days a week. New York, New York exists within a bubble when it comes to protections uh, of those kind of rights. The real concern and the real worry on the part of everyone should be what happens if there's an outbreak and what can be done uh, as um, uh, to prevent an outbreak. For instance, every single day we turn on, on the television and both the mayor and the governor are talking about the uh, lack of resources in the city, the lack of, of test kits, lack of masks and things of that nature, they're talking societally. So if those things are scarcity in the city at large, then you know that they are scarcity within the jail and in the prison system. So because, let's touch upon that, Imam Talib, if you don't yeah. mind. I apologize to interrupt you. And Not I agree with you 100% with regards to the scarcity of resources. And certainly one of the biggest concerns is the medical attention, whether or not they would be able to handle anything like that. And my understanding is that families are not able to visit, you know, all as a precautionary measure. But it only right. takes one person to have the virus and for it to spread to spread very quickly like wildfire through a prison system. Absolutely. So um, what are the resources like? I mean, God forbid, would you be able to tell us if, if there was a spread in a prison system? I'm assuming, and you talked about visiting people who were sick, you know, for hospitals. Are the hospitals within the prison system, you know, even able to do this? Or would we see sort of um, a... a the need to bring people out of the prison system and into major hospitals outside of the prison system to handle something like this? I, I can't say. I mean, the again, this is we all, we're very early in the process. I will say that the prioritization of the health needs and concerns of the incarcerated uh, is one that is of low priority in relation to the society. Yeah, are there medical facilities? Yes. Are there, uh, uh, do incarcerated men and women receive uh, a high level quality medical care? No, because they're poor people. That's who's incarcerated. You know, uh, you'll, you'll have an exception like uh, According to reports, uh, Harvey Weinstein um, has pet tested positively for uh, COVID-19. Now, he's in a prison right now in upstate New York. Um, based upon my experience, I doubt very seriously that Harvey Weinstein is receiving the same kind of care as, uh, you know, or Jorge uh, Hernandez, or uh, you know Michael Black from out of the hood, even though they might be in the same facility. So this is a very and 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 understand. So what we're talking about, this is part of a larger problem, and it's a larger problem that has to do with the prison industrial complex in America. And that, in turn, when you're talking medically, that, in turn, is part of a larger problem uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders is always talking about, which has to do with, you know, the general state of the, uh, the population 
in the United States and the whole issue of, of health care. Sister Zofa, pivoting to you, uh, I mean, you know, I think your situation is a bit different from what Imam Talib is saying, because in your capacity, Sorry. obviously, people are already in hospitals and they're in the middle of receiving medical care, right? So it's a very different situation. Mm -hmm. But I, what I do Sorry. worry about is the lack of companionship that seems to plague so many people within the hospital setting and how that plays mm -hmm. into the morale of patients, for example, their ability to recoup, their ability to get on, uh, on a road to recovery and health. Um, and that human kindness, that human compassion, sometimes is so critical to be able to simply sit with someone the way that you described earlier today. Um, so would you be able to tell us, are family visitations, are they still being permitted at hospitals? And what other resources do patients have if they can't see volunteers like yourself or chaplains under extreme circumstances? What would you imagine some of those people that you've helped, you know, what are they going through? God knows, you know, it, it is so important. What they are letting family visit their, their loved one unless if it's a case of the COVID virus, that's the case that you would not get visitors. They're not allowing visitors for that, that situation. However, patient can still communicate with chaplain or their family member via phone call. That, that's the only way you could like pray with them over the phone, comfort them. At this point of time, that's the only situation, even if they left visitors come, they really minimize it so it's just one family member. What so, recommendations would you have then for those that are laying in bed who find themselves extremely lonely? If you were able to get a message to them, what would do you think that message would be or that advice would be? If I have to get a message for them, I would say, you know, you're, you are in our prayers. We're here for you. We cannot see you, we cannot touch you, but we are praying for you. That's all we can do at this time, just prayers. And, and you know, I think this is a good, um, good segue into speaking about really what has been driving both of your efforts, and that is your faith and your Muslim identity and why you've dedicated yourself to this passion. And, you know, I think Imam Talib, if I can start with you, maybe you can you know, just tell us, obviously you're an imam, you've dedicated your life to teaching people about the faith, to living it and being an example of that as an imam. And then again, as a chaplain to those that often society have forgotten. Imam, would you please just, you know, convey to, to the general Muslim Umar who like myself have never been in a prison and don't understand the, the complexities and, and as well as just uh, the lack of compassion that I would imagine every inmate feels um, what do we need to be aware of with regards to our Islamic faith and how can we be better compassionate and empathize with them? And how has your own Islamic identity driven you to this type of work in particular? Well, again, within the prison context, and let me just say, I just want to support uh, what our sister has been saying to us. And I hope everyone is listening to her very carefully. Uh, my my work is not confined and has not been confined to the prison. You know, as I said, I'm the imam of the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood. I'm a societal Muslim leader of a 54-year-old congregation here in New York City. And that means that uh, one of the things that we do in our work as a congregation, as a Jamaat, is visiting hospitals, visiting um, nursing homes, for instance. And these institutions are impacted by all of these restrictions that are, that are occurring. Um, if you, uh, the, the greatest source of volunteers within um, the jail and prison system are religious volunteers by far. Other people don't necessarily volunteer to go into that type of environment. And it's the same thing when it comes to hospitals. It's the same thing that when it comes to nursing homes, it's the religious volunteers that help provide that uh, 
for them. Outreach is very important uh, for them. And the same thing, uh, I hesitate to really say this as an absolute, but all but it, in comparable ways to the, the in, incarcerated, because they too are shut in in, uh, in institutions. And as I said, people had to die, literally, in order to create, in the case of Muslim chaplains. And, and, and let me just recommend to those people who might be watching this or listening to this, if you're not familiar with the history, you need to go study the history of the Attica Prison Rebellion in Attica, New York, uh, and up near Rome, New York in 1971. It was a very, uh, it was resolved in a very bloody fashion. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller was the governor uh, at that time. And when you study the list of demands for those prisoners who put their lives on the line, the, 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 what was their list of demands? They were not political. It wasn't a political riot. It had to do with human rights, with humane treatment. They mentioned things that um, other people out here in society might take for granted. They, they, and, and, and this was something that occurred across faith lines, across religious lines, across racial lines, across ethnic lines. And you might be shocked to see uh, people willing to, for instance, to put their lives on the line to have a diet in prison that does not include pork. But back, you know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, uh, all, all, all of the food served in, 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 in prison had a very heavy pork diet. That's no longer the case. Uh, 40, 50 years ago, the only chaplains that existed within the prison system were Catholic chaplains. And perhaps, perhaps uh, to a lesser degree, Protestant chaplains. Other faith groups, there were no Muslim chaplains. So people had to sacrifice, people had to die for this. Um, although the numbers are not as great as they used to be, that large number of volunteers who would come in to the jails and prisons, they who are Muslims, they were strictly motivated by faith. They were motivated as Muslims. Uh, 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 it's in many cases, some of them formerly incarcerated persons themselves. They were motivated to want to serve, to want to give back by the uh, principle that we have as Muslims, as wanting for your brother or sister uh, in faith what you want for yourself and your faith not being complete until uh, or unless you are willing to live out or demonstrate that, that uh, sort of uh, commitment. And so again, um, faith is essential. There are people who lose their faith, Muslims, who lose their faith in society and regain it during incarceration. There are young people, increasing number of young people who are incarcerated in the prisons of New York now who come from Muslim families. And I don't just mean, you know, African-Americans or Latinos. They come from Arab families. They come from uh, uh, Pakistani, Bangladeshi uh, families. They come from continental African families. And their, their parents and grandparents come from Muslim countries where these young people are raised here in America and they've been swept up in the same, same type of dysfunction as other young people are. And they lose their faith in society but they find it again in prison where being Muslim is not something that can be taken for granted. It has to be uh -huh. a conscious choice. SubhanAllah. 
it, it's really such a such a beautiful beautiful message and i thank you for pointing that out i mean the idea of people finding their faith and and finding allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during such dire circumstances and we really owe that a lot to those that serve this these populations and sister zilpa i'll give the last few minutes to you please if you can you know again i think i always try to go back to these type of messages because really it's what drives us as as people of faith and it's important for all of us to be reminded and to understand what it is about our faith that promotes such service so if you can again you know last few minutes for you please just sort of share with us your own your own feelings on how it is that your Islamic identity has really driven you to this type of work which you're obviously emotional about and committed to can you guys hear me? Wa alaikum assalam. Sister Selena, we see you. Um, Brother oh. Fred, hold on one minute, Sister Selena. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have Fred mute you and I'll explain how you're joining on to this panel. So just give me a moment. Fred, okay. if you, Fred, if you can message her offline and we'll let uh, Sister Zilfa finish her sentence. And then I guess I'll introduce Sister Selena and she can give us, you know, some last words. I'll bring her up to speed. So sisters, if I apologize for that interruption, please. <laughs> so I was saying, you know, when everything else failed, when the doctor gave up a patient, let's say, for example, a, a cancer patient, a patient is in hospice, patient, and all they are being told, they take up all medication and they're being told that, you know, we cannot do anything for you anymore. At that time, all that person needs is prayers and prayers and comfort, words of comfort and prayers. And, you know, no one deserves to die alone. You know, having someone by your bedside means a lot. And at that time, when, when chaplains cannot go to reach those demands, those situations, it's very, very hard and hurtful for a patient, a chaplain to know that they cannot provide their service at this time with this coronavirus. Um, I hope and pray that something can come about and that, you know, we can able to help those, those patients, um, whatever situation it seems like it's getting worse, but I do hope that those patients can be well, taken care of. And inshallah, I mean, certainly I hope that those that are listening and watching extend their prayers and well wishes to those in these situations, both within hospital beds, as well as those that are incarcerated in prisons. Um, a moment ago, you heard the voice of Sister Selena, which is actually a sister who was in prison herself a little um, many years ago and then came out and has done tremendous work, including volunteer work. I don't know if we're able to get her on um, let me just check in. Can Sister Selena, are you able to join us? Yes, I hear you. I don't see you guys, but I hear you. All right. So this is what's going to happen. Because we are at the tail end of this, uh, of this webinar, let me just explain to the viewers. So Sister Selena Fulford is a sister, which I'll allow her to introduce herself and her personal experience. Sister Selena, what I'd like for you to do is I'll give these last few minutes to you in which you can tell people what your personal experience is, how you're helping as a volunteer um, and how your Islamic faith has sort of pushed to this service and how this service has been impacted because of the pandemic. And, and I should also, I would be remiss to explain to those that are listening and, to, and watching is Sister Selena was a panelist originally, but then she herself fell ill so, Sister Selena, how are you feeling first and foremost? And then maybe you can move forward and, and tell people a little bit about yourself and your volunteer service. Okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. So, I'm feeling okay. I have a, I went to the emergency room with the 105 temperature. I left there with 107 temperature. They gave me some Tylenol. They told me that they're no longer testing people because they're going to run out of tests. So, I guess you probably have to come there unconscious and, and you know and then maybe you'll get a test i don't know but they sent me home with a bottle of tylenol so i have a massive headache and a high fever they said my pressure was up as well but alhamdulillah i'm fine 
So what I did was as soon as I got from the hospital, I immediately dialed in because I wanted to try to catch some of the conference. And I apologize for not being there at the beginning, but I work in the homeless shelter and there's 400 homeless men in the shelter where I live at, I mean, where I work at. And so we've had a couple of clients come up positive. We have a couple of staff members that have came back positive. And so they told us that we was, um, you know, exposed to it and that eventually we would get sick or not. So this is my sick, so alhamdulillah, I'm still okay. So anyway, um, I was in prison. Um, I was upstate in 1998. I went to prison, I went upstate. I did two years, um, and that's, to me, that's such a little bit of time compared to my friends. I have sisters that that, that has done uh, 39 years, wow. 25 years, 17 years, and so I feel like I cheated because I only had to do two years, but two years in prison is, two days in prison is entirely too long. So real quickly, I just want to say that I spoke to the chaplain from the women's prison upstate last night, and I asked her, was there any movement? How was the women? And so she said that the women are fine. They're not asking for anything. They're just asking for the chaplains to come in and talk to them and give them spiritual uplifting, but the chaplains have been mandated to stay out. So they can't come in. They can't talk to them. Um, they can't have any visits, no family visits. They can't have, they don't have any programming going on because all the volunteers that come in have been mandated to stay out. So she said that the only thing that they do have is rec because they have to, it's mandated that they have to let them out into an open space where they can have some recreation movement. So they, they're doing that and like, that's about it. Um... Yeah. Well, you know, Sister Selena, you mentioned two things and, you know, we've spoken to Imam Talib a lot about the prison system and, and we didn't really necessarily touch upon the circumstances of our sisters that are in the prison system. Um, but I would imagine that much of what Imam Talib explained also will apply there. But, you know, at the beginning, you said something yourself with regards to your own work with the homeless shelters. And let's not, you know, just glance over that and pretend as if that's not important because the homeless population is also extremely underserved, also yes. extremely overlooked. And the work that you do is not just to serve as a chapel, as, a, uh, as a, an ally and a friend, but also as an advocate. And I'm wondering what kind of services are available to the homeless population as far as you see. You already know that they've been exposed, you yourself, unfortunately have put yourself at risk to that exposure. Do they have the same access to medical care, the, the homeless oh. that you know the others would? And what are you seeing yes. over there with regards to that work? Well, we have, we have a clinic area inside the shelter. So that's a good thing. So as the clients are coming in and feeling sick and being tested, they are immediately being sent out to the hospital. So far, only one client did not come back. Um, he was tested positive. And um, so they have him in some um, undisclosed location. Um, a friend of mine told me that the city has rented floors on, on the hotels because I guess the hotels are not in use. And so they are written hotel rooms and they're, they're, they're quarantining the homeless in unused hotel spaces. So, yeah, other than that, I mean, the, the clients, are they're, they're fine. They don't have, the only thing that's messed up about it is that they have masks for the staff. They have uh, sanitizer, hand sanitizer and gloves for the staff, but they have none for the clients. Mm. So it's almost like a, a you know, it, it, it's just crazy because they don't have anything, no kind of protection. And they're, whatever they touch, we touch. So we're still right. at this. Yeah. Well, I think this warrants a discussion in and of its own, and I really appreciate you mentioning at least this much, so maybe we can take a deeper look into how the pandemic is putting those homeless people and the general population at risk if we don't, if we don't apply the same kind of concern. And I think that's really been the overarching theme here with regards to 
you know, empathy, compassion, concern, letting our Islamic um, identity to guide us in those principles to those populations of our society that are often overlooked. And I would encourage all of you to do what Sister Zilpha has said, and that is let's remember these folks in our prayers and our da'as and our supplications, inshallah. And let's also reach out to whatever extent that we can to those that are in positions that volunteer their time and, and ask what we can do to be a part of the solution in general. And it first comes with some basic knowledge that's led you know, with information, but also that basic compassion that we must have for one another as brothers and sisters in Islam, but also as a family and humanity. So I thank every single one of you. Um, Sister Selena, you of course are in our prayers to feel better. I'll be checking thank in you. with you offline, inshallah. And thank then hopefully once you feel better, we can get back on the, on the computer with you, inshallah, and we can talk a little bit more about your work. Sister uh, Zilpa and Imam Talib, I'm immensely grateful to both of you for your service as well as the time you've given us. Jazakum Allah khairan. Well, Jazakum, uh, this, uh, if I may, very quickly, this parting thought. One, that same population that Sister Selena is talking about, that's the same population that ends up in jail. That's the majority population that's on Rikers Island. That's the majority population that will end up in prison uh, in uh, upstate New York. You're talking then, about homeless people, Imam? Yeah, I'm talking about poor people, homeless yeah. people, people with uh, you know mental health problems, et, et cetera. That's who feeds the prison system. And also, I really pray that our sister uh, Zilpha and our sister Selena I really pray that Allah bless them and we should Amen. make you all for sisters like this. You know, Amen. these are sisters who could be doing a whole lot of other things. They they have master's degrees. They are professional people. That includes Sister Selena. She was incarcerated 20 years ago, but now she's a professional person and they could be doing a lot of things. But instead of cushy jobs, they have jobs look, looking after the most weak and vulnerable people Absolutely. in the society. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. And Sister I mean, Selena, you need to go get in the bed. And turn yes, I am, Imam, I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jazakum Allah khairan. And Imam Talib, let's not forget you from our da'as. You've had a lifetime of giving and you still are. Jazakum Allah khair. to every Absolutely. single one of you. You are all each individually and collectively in our prayers as, a, as well as many others, I'm sure. And with that, I'll be letting everyone go. We thank all of those who have taken time to view this as well as those who will be viewing this later. We'll be circulating links. If any of you have resources or information you'd like for us to share with the viewership, please do not hesitate to contact me. And we'll be happy to post them. And again, thank you so much. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.